Okay, so hi again. The next talk is starting now. We have Ralph Heinkel here. Uh, Ralph started using Python in 1998. No, 80, 18, 18, 90, 98. 90, yeah, right. Roughly. For um, uh, started Python developing in 1998, and mainly for biocomputing. Biocomputing, and nowadays he's working as a freelance Python DevOps, and he's going to talk about how you can use Python and R for statistical analysis. So give a warm applause for Ralph and enjoy his talk. Yeah, hello and good morning, everybody, and welcome to this talk about um, how to build a bridge between Python and R. Um, how many of you know R or are using? Can we just give a quick? Okay, so most of you guys, as far as I can see. For those who don't know what R is, R is basically a huge package or a tool for doing statistical analysis and calculating graphical representation of your data. It's open source, runs on all major platforms like Windows, Linux, Mac, and um, the language of R itself is, in my opinion, not so great. Python is a much better language to program in, but R, the real power of R, I think, comes from the huge library of packages that's available around it, and uh, you can most, download most of those packages from the CRAN uh, network. Um, the situation we faced when I started this project was that Python and R were basically completely separate ecosystems. And when we wanted to do a statistical analysis with data from Python, we had to basically pack it into a CSV files, transport them over to, Py uh, to R, do the analysis, and put them back into Python. And that was not really very convenient for us. Um, so there are packages which solve that problem. Like at that time, there was RPy. Now there's RPy2. And these are basically extension packages for R in Python. So you uh, compile R into a module, you import it, and then this RPy2 module provides functionality to access R, do evaluation, um, and get your results directly in Python. It has a slight disadvantage, which was a disadvantage for us, that R runs in the same process as Python, or even on the same machine. So when Python, in our case, was running a web application server and we wanted to do analysis in R, uh, and that was a heavy analysis, that was really slowing down our web server. So we had to spread out R on a different machine, and that was the approach we were taking. That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, we wanted to build a bridge between Python and R and to be able to run R on a different computer or on a form of computers even. And the first piece of that bridge, the first socket, is rsurf. rsurf is a TCPI server for R developed by Simon Urbanek. It allows for multiple simultaneous connections from arbitrary number of clients, arbitrary as long as the machine can take it, of course. And every client that connects to that R server via TCP IP has its own namespace, so all calculations are really done without side effects. Clients, by default, are available besides the Python one for Java, C++, C Sharp, and so on. And there's a growing number of clients for RSERF. Part of them come with the RSERF package directly. Uh, other clients, you can load, load, uh, download as third-party packages from the RForge uh, server and install them. So the second piece of that bridge is PyRSERF. That's the part that I have been writing. Um, it's a pure client adapter for connecting via TCP IP to RSERF. What it does, it serializes Python data objects over the network, sends them to R, R can do some calculation with it, and the serialized um, result data is deserialized or parsed on the Python side. Oops. And um, native Python result objects are created by that. It allows to um, uh, to 
to evaluate arbitrary uh, R commands on the R side, on the R server. You can trigger functions, function calls in R. You can set and get variables in the R namespace. And a latest addition uh, to PyR surface that it allows R code to trigger commands in your Python interpreter from the R side. And I will show that later. The missing piece of that bridge is the protocol, which the, these two um, sockets are talking to each other. That's the QAP1 protocol, Quad Attributes protocol, which sounds much bigger than it is. It's, I think it's invented by um, Simon just for the purpose of letting our clients talk to our server. Uh, it's a little bit of protocol like maybe Pickle in Python, but it allows to exchange serialized objects between R and Python, not just within the Python ecosphere. And it doesn't only allow to um, serialize data, it also contains uh, commands so that R, the R server side knows what to do with the data that you're sending to the R side. It's a synchronous protocol, um, so you send off a command and you send off your data to the R server and you have to wait until what you get back. Even if it's just a, a non-object, you have to wait until the R connection really has finished the calculation so you cannot send off a second command to the same connection. If you want to do parallel computing, you have to do, you have to open multiple connections on the R server, which is possible from the R, from the Python side. And, yeah. Installation is quite easy. You download, um, R from the R server, from the, from the, um, um, yeah, source server. It's not possible to use the pre-compiled packages because for running R serve, you need to compile and link R with a special flag, this enable R shared libs. Otherwise, R serve cannot be loaded into this, in a, into the execution space of R. R serve can be di directly compiled by R. So there's, uh, R brings its own compiler for packages. It's R command install and then the new packages, which you have downloaded before. And finally, the missing piece on the Python side is just a Python package downloadable from uh, PyPy server. It runs on all major modern Python versions from 2.6 on to 3.4. Um, it needs NumPy. Uh, if NumPy is installed, it's fine. Otherwise, it will install NumPy on the fly. Starting is also easy. The server side is just started with this R command. R surf opens a connection on the uh, network, and by default, it only listens to a local host. That's its security feature, um, because in the older times, R surf didn't have a way to protect access to it, so there was no um, password check. It's now built in on the R surf side. It's not yet built in the Pi R surf side, so that's why by default they only listen to private IP addresses on the local host. When you connect to um, R serve server running on uh, your local machine, it's enough to call PyRserv Pi connect. Uh, it goes to localhost on, by default. If you want to connect to a, a remote machine, just provide a host name and provide a port if you're running on a non-default port on the server side. Um, the connection itself has some attributes, so you can um, see where you're connecting to. It's, that's especially interesting if you have multiple parallel connections on, open on your Python side, so you can see where which connection is connecting to where. You can close the connection. You can see if the connection is closed and so on. So now we come to the first real steps. What can you do um, with such a Python, uh, with such a connection to R serve? The connector itself provides a, a method called eval that allows you to send arbitrary R expressions, R commands to the R side. Let it, let R evaluate that string expression and receive the result back as a native Python object on the Python side. So here I just uh, run a, just summing up two numbers. You can also call Functions in R, the C operator in R creates an array, a numeric array on the, on the R side. And since eval returns the result of that expression, what you get is that a numeric, that array 
um, why there's uh, something popping up here all the time. You get that connected into a NumPy array on the Python side. Um, sometimes it's not always you want to re return the result back from R. So when you assign a very complex data structure to a variable on the R side, that's nothing you want to see on the Python side because it would have to be serialized from R, passed through the network, and deserialized on the Python side. And if you just want to assign it to a variable, you want to avoid that. So for that case, there's an, uh, a variant of the eval command called void eval, which just executes the expression on the R side and just doesn't return anything to Python. If you still want to see the, uh, the value of the variable, avar, you just can use the eval command. Some more examples of string evaluations, like here you can even define a function on the R side. So here I create a function call times two, which takes one argument, and the second eval command just provides, uh, executes that function, and the result is returned back to Python. You can even uh, evaluate multi-line scripts, which you can define in Python, you store them in, in a string or whatever, send them over, execute them, and they get the result back. I think that's pretty well straightforward. So the do, using eval is very sort of the basic usage of uh, connecting to R or communicating with R. Um, a connector provides a much more interesting attribute called R, which represents the namespace of your R interpreter running on the remote side. So via this attribute R, you can access uh, variables and set variables in the R interpreter. Um, you can make function calls, and you have to watch out. Namespaces are separate, as I said before, for every connection, but they are also getting deleted once your connection is closed. So you have to make sure either you save your workspace in, in R or you just lose whatever's in there. So just to see uh, the difference between string evaluation and using real uh, namespace approach is these two commands do basically the same thing. Uh, a variable avar is uh, instantiated on the R side with a string abc. And the first approach is the string evaluation part. The second one is doing exactly the same, same thing, just very Pythonic. So it looks like abc is assigned to a local variable in R but it's actually serialized and sent over to R and uh, set in that namespace. It's even possible to um, set more complex data, so that's an example where I create a NumPy array in Python, give it a shape, and assign that, that array to a variable called a matrix, or an attribute, and also that NumPy array is serialized, sent over to R, and a native uh, R array is uh, created on the R side, and the last call with con eval dim a matrix shows you that you can access that array in R and get the dimension as a as a result. Um, how are functions called in that Pythonic way using the uh, um, R namespace? I'm creating here just to, pre uh, to demonstrate that. I'm creating three very simple functions. The first one doesn't take an argument just returns a static string. The second one takes one argument, doubles the value, and returns it. And the last one takes um, keyword arguments, so that what you can do in R looks very Pythonic already. And now that's the way you call it. You just use the R namespace, call function zero, get a string, provide a argument, and provide a, keyboard, uh, a keyword value to the last one and get the, li the list back. I think that's very easy to see and to understand. A more complex thing is our, some R functions allow to uh, uh, accept another function as an argument, maybe like the map functions in Python. It, uh, it accepts the data structure and the function you can map it against. S apply in uh, R does basically the same thing, just the arguments are uh, the other uh, different order. So it um, takes a, a, an array and allows you to pass a function in R to be applied to it. So that's also possible. You can, re refer, you can refer to a function that's sitting on the R side from Python, con R times two. 
Um, it's important not to pass references to Python functions. That doesn't make sense. So like the double is a, here I define a function in Python and if you try to refer to that function, of course, it's not possible to serialize functions from Python into R. You can serialize data, but not functions, so that gives you a, non, a name error because um, double is just not defined on the R side. This example also shows you that um, PyRSERF can uh, handle errors, errors that are raised on the R side. So I'm also, when, when an uh, expression is uh, evaluated, I'm looking at the result and I can see if there's an error raised and I can drag over the error message from R into Python and raise a uh, exception providing that me uh, the, the message that R sends to me. So the name double is not defined is basically what um, R tells me. Um, this example shows you that things can be rather inefficient if you don't do it right. So here what I'm doing, I'm creating a NumPy array and assign it to a variable R ARR on R side. And then I make a function call with as apply where I provide that array as an argument and um, referring to the times two function, which is then applied to every argument in the array. So why is that inefficient? What that really does is that it's assigning in the first line the array on the R side, then I'm pulling the array back over the network into Python, and the last line pushes the array back to R, and so the array is sent back and forth three times. And to avoid that, there is this additional um, attribute or this additional namespace um, attribute that I referenced before, which is called ref, which that allows you to reference an, a data object in R without actually pulling it over. So it just provides you a proxy to that. And here in that example now, you use that to re reference an array which exists in R and supply that as an argument to the as apply function. So that avoids that data is sent back and forth three times. Um, out of bound messages, messages. that's uh, one of the latest additions. Um, that allows R code to send messages into your Python interpreter, which on the Python side uh, trigger the call of a, of a callback function that you can define. Um, in order to make that work, you need to um, start rserve with a special flag enable in a config, config file. So that's the OOB enable, which you can see here in that example. And you have to start rserve to use that config file with the rsconf uh, command line option. That starts up the uh, additional code in rserve for callback messages. The way it's set up, it's very easy. You define a callback function in Python that takes two arguments. Message is basically the message you want to see from uh, R. It's the payload of the actual uh, callback. And message code is an additional um, qualifier that helps it to interpret what you have received in message. And that can be defined when the callback is triggered. And you see that in a moment. In order to uh, make that callback um, accepted, it has to be assigned to a special attribute in the connector called OOB callback. So you just assign that to it. And whenever PyRSERF receives a out of bound message, that method will then be called. Um, so that's a, two simple examples. The, to trigger a callback from R, you have to call the self OOB send call. The self has nothing to do with Python self. It's just a namespace um, thingy in R. Um, I don't un really understand why Simon has implemented that way, but it's done, so that's the way to call it. So the first call you see, I just send a message, no message code, and when I print out what I receive in the callback, you see the message code is always zero by default. The second call here, I can override the zero, send a, uh, a more qualified um, message code. And the next example will show, or the, one of the next examples will show you why you should want to do that. One possible application of doing um, 
um, callbacks is provide a um, feedback message for your progress. So here you see a fake, uh, um, a dummy big jaw function which has intermittent callbacks or will be sent since how far your calculation has been done. I'm setting up a primitive callback method in, in Python which just prints it for, for that case and then when I call the big job, uh, you see the callbacks are, the, the callback messages are printed out while the R function is still running and then at the end you get the result back and can do anything with it. Um, another very nice um, application of that is um, to have a method dispatcher so you can make a callback from R and control which kind of callback method is then actually called. For doing that, I'm defining three constants on the R side and the Python side. I'm setting up a dictionary in Python and assigning three different functions to be called depending on what kind of message code I receive. A very a small dispatcher method is created as a callback function which just accepts the message code, looks up the appropriate function in the function dictionary and calls it with the message I receive. And here you can see I make a callback, provide the argument foo and I want to see the cstore method called which actually just appends the message that I receive into the list called store and when I print the list it has one argument. So that's a very nice feature and um, try, try it out if, if you haven't seen it. I'm coming to the end, small discussion of this network approach. So the, uh, a good thing about, uh, compared to the RPI um, approach is when, when you have multiple people in your group, in your team, and all, they, they are all doing calculations and you want to make sure everybody runs on the exact R version and the exact versions of all R packages that you're using. Having one single installation on the server is much easier to maintain than uh, as when every team member has to maintain and to ensure that all run the same versions. Um, and what you can do for um, um, what it allows you, if you have free compute, uh, compute intensive stuff, to uh, set up a real R compute farm and have a load balancer which distributes uh, CPU intensive jobs to different R servers. The con side, of course, you have to serialize all your data that you're sending back and forth. If you're sending a huge amount of data, that can be really a, a bottleneck for you. So it's always a thing you have to balance out yourself. Security aspects is the last thing. As I said before, and the R surf side now, nowadays allows to um, have credential things so you can log in, log out. Um, PyRSF doesn't have that, so in the moment it's best to just use it in-house. So that's the talk for now. Thank you for your attention, and if you have questions. Any questions from anyone? Okay. So thanks for the talk, very interesting approach. Um, first question is, did I get it right? Do you have uh, one session per connection which keeps the state? Yeah, there's, on the one, there's one, one namespace, one session per connection. Okay, exactly, so yeah. it's suitable for multiple users? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And can you say anything more about the serialization of the data you're using? Uh, you mean the protocol, what I'm doing? Yeah. Ah, okay. It's a, it's a binary format invented by a... Um, uh, Simon, and there's a very elaborate documentation on his website. It's, it's basically working the same way as Pickle does. So it uh, recurses into your data and goes down the, the, the tree for a simple data that's simple, but for nested dictionaries, lists, and tuples, all that can be serialized. And it basically has the same approach, just that this uh, um, serialization protocol is not Python specific, but it's R server specific. So all clients and all servers can interact with that. Um, I mean, going into a technical details would just be too much for that talk, but it, everything can be looked up on the website. Have you considered to implement any other clients? Other, other than languages? Python, other than Python client? Or? or no, Ruby or just other languages? Because I mean, once you're using serializing data, so it doesn't matter, uh, you know, what you use as a client. I mean, a Ruby client already exists. 
Um, you mean that we can uh, exchange binary data between different languages, so have a, a network of uh, connections? Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, that's maybe an interesting approach. I haven't thought about that. Um, it could be useful as a general way to uh, exchange binary data between different languages or different systems. Yeah, that's an yeah, interesting idea. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Then there are no more questions. Uh, any, uh, no? Any, uh, any other questions? No? Okay. Yeah, so thanks very much to Ralph for the talk.